Hi, I'm Femi O.K. And I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Last week, we spoke to active and retired U.S. police officers about police reform. It is such a pressing topic, and there's so much to talk about that we brought them back. Graham Weatherspoon is a retired New York City Police Department detective. Detective Derek Waller is also with the NYPD. And in Seattle, Washington, Betty Taylor, an educator and former police chief in the city of Winfield in the U.S. state of Missouri. We remember where we left off. What a great place to start again, Malika. It is. So it was a video comment from Lawrence, who is the son of a police officer. I'm going to play it again for our audience so they're refreshed as well. This is what Lawrence told the stream. Hello, my name is Lawrence Grand Prix. I'm the son of a cop, but also a police reform advocate working here in Baltimore, Maryland. While the Department of Justice has just arrived, in the piece I work for The Guardian, my group consistently explains that local and state law and actually internal disciplinary procedures that determine a big chunk of police discipline and reestablishing trust with the community. My question to you is, is that if policing is a public service paid for with public money, shouldn't we, must we, have a system of public accountability when police are accused of wrongdoing, such as having trained non-police officers instead of police officers themselves deciding if cops get fired. So Derek, public money should lead to public accountability. I think, um, I think police officers need to be held accountable for their actions, that's period. But I think that there also needs to be some type of outside agency outside of the police department to, to somewhat investigate these, these, uh, these acts. Mm. It needs to be because the police office, the police department, for some reason, has a way of shutting stuff down and not getting everything, all the information out to the public, and the public needs to know what goes on. And the first thing that happens when, 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 a, when, a, when a person is shot, stabbed, they, they look at the criminal record of that person first. Mm -hmm. But you never hear about the police officer's past disciplinary history, which we need to know also. Either none yes. or all. And truthfully, we the only thing in that's important is what happened on the day of the incident. Mm. A person's past performance has nothing to do with what has happened on that given day. Um, I call it poisoning the jury pool because they will release that and disseminate that information to the public so that when it comes to trial or goes to a grand jury, the public already knows, oh, yeah, he was arrested eight times, yeah. so he must have been doing something wrong. And you can never get a fair trial like so that. So just for our audience for purposes, uh, kind of describing this, and Betty, I know you want to get in there, but that would be uh, something that is then leaked to the media, and so you get things like, he was no angel, which was right. said about Michael Brown, right. uh, to then, as some would to say, give justification for, for why he was then killed. Fired. Yeah. Betty? Yeah, and, and we shouldn't be investigating ourselves. And when I say that, I say that, uh, let's take a rural county, there's a shooting or, or some somewhere where everybody knows everybody. So you might call in the highway patrol, and the highway patrol says, oh, well, this guy's always a good guy, and, and, and take away that, that already known knowledge of this officer and bring in the, this, this criminal history of, the, of this person. We need to deal with the incident and what happened then. This person might not be an angel, but did this person deserve to die for a traffic stop? Let me just bring up the story of Laquan McDonald. He's in the news again. I'm going to show you the video. You may remember it because this video went around the world. So Laquan McDonald was a 17-year-old. He was shot 16 times by the Chicago police. I know we have that video, so we're, we're play it for you out of the control room. Um, and it took a year, and only because journalists asked to see this video, for this video to be released. Um, I mean, it's an incredible scenario. And then, fast forward to this month, this is what's happening. Chicago police recommend firing of seven cops for false reports. Is that accountability? I mean, they're not fired yet for this incident, but do you think this will actually happen? If you, as a police officer, are a liar and are filing false reports, you have no business in any law enforcement agency. Police officers had to be, have to be held to a higher accountability than the average citizen. We give officers too much authority, too much power, and it has to be checked. And when you violate that trust, you need to be held to a, a higher accountable uh, authority. You know, black lives are, are, are not... You know, when, when a black person... Is, is, is killed, it, it doesn't have as much impact as, as when a white person is killed. I'll give you an example. Um, some, some time ago in my precinct, there was a, actually this, this woman was raped. She was brutally, she was, she was actually followed from the elevator to the roof landing, brutally beat up and raped on the landing. Happened once. 
Happened again about a week later. Same, same, uh, same scenario. Happened a third time. I mean, this is some, some, some couple of just black chicks in the projects. Nobody gives a crap about. So, it was not made a pattern. Basically, just some black people. Nobody. If, if this same incident would have happened on 96th Street and Broadway to some white, it would have been, it would have been all over the news. So, so, so different lives mean different things to the media and to people. You know, and that, that's that's you know something. Sometimes we, we hate to admit things, but this is the reality behind a black person getting killed and a white getting killed the offices, right now in America. The officers filing false mm -hmm. reports are perpetuating the cover-ups. All right. And they need to be stripped of their shield if this is what they did. In New York City, the patrol guide says that if an officer lies during the course of an investigation, Perjury. that's grounds for termination, Perjury. flat out. How often does that happen? Not often. at all. Not I, I, often enough. I think, I think officers lie quite, quite often. But to be caught doing it is, is, is a different thing. Like I said, you know, a lot, a lot of officers, they, they make phone calls. You know, your father's the chief. You make, you make phone calls and things get done within the police department. That's the way it's always been, and that's the way it's going oh. to continue to be. So, I mean, you know, there's, there's been plenty of cases where officers lied and, and tried. Let me just remind you, this, this show's about reform. <laughs> You're just, you okay, are just okay, okay. loading me up with all the things about wow. why reform is needed. In that same breath, can you tell me, how do you fix it? How do you fix officers lying? Uh, there's, there's, there's no way to fix it, but I think Ooh. going back to fixing this whole relation between community and policing, it goes back to the training of the new officers. Mm -hmm. It all goes back to the training because they're going to do what they're taught in the police academy. So if they're taught be this aggressive officer, that's what you're going to be, and lies come with that. The guy says his tail light wasn't out. You know, hey, if you write on that summons, his tail, if I write on that summons, he was riding a white unicorn down Nostrand Avenue, that's what the judge is going to believe because my, my word as a police officer has a lot of power when you go to court and on that summons. It has a lot of power. So this guy that's been locked up four, five, six, seven times, nobody's going to believe him. Why should they? So, you Femi, know? you asked, okay, okay, this is a show about reform. How yeah. do you fix it? Here yeah. is one suggestion. Uh -huh. This is SMJ on Twitter. She says police can start by refraining from deflecting the issue of brutality. Unions and leaders should also stop protecting cops who murder. So murder is one thing. Betty, I know you had um, an experience uh, that involved brutality, though not murder. Um, you were mm -hmm. executing a search warrant uh, when you left the room and came back and you saw your suspect looking like what? Uh, my partner and I had had handcuffed the guy, put him on the couch. He was fine. Uh, the two drug officers said, hey, we need to speak with him. So we went to do inventory, came back, and he's got a broken nose. Hmm. So I went, you know, I, I thought, I, listen, I'm going to file a complaint. I don't know this guy was compliant when I left. And um, so my I went to my lieutenant. My lieutenant didn't do anything. I went to the sheriff. The sheriff said, uh, it's ha being handled internally. Nothing ever happened, and that was in the late 90s. Nothing ever happened to this officer, and there was a lot of creative report writing, is what we uh, would, would call it, because uh, it was creative. It wasn't really what happened. So soon after that, I left and uh, became chief of my own department, where you you got to start with leadership. If you bring in that culture of these jackbooted thugs, that's what you're going to get. And I, I, one of the things I would ask when I was hiring was you know what do, how do you feel about the about the public in general because then you get you get officers who are jaded and are like they hate it they just don't like anyone they don't believe they've been lied to so many times which they just don't know how to associate with the public anymore you know that that reform is going to start with the training like she said i mean it's going to start with the training of the new police officers you know they're going to have to be totally retrained a lot of the guys like senior guys like me they don't want to deal with this anymore with the harassment that's coming from the higher up, you know? It's coming from the superiors up at the top and headquarters. So basically, we do what we're told to a certain extent. So that reform is going to start with the retraining of the new officers from the police academy. They got to be retrained, you know, not to be that overly aggressive police officer. And this, this is not something that's going to happen in one month or two years or three years. This is something that's going to take time. Is it happening right now? You know, I, I think there is the tendency to respond to the outcries. Mm -hmm. But it's like a venting process. You scream, you carry on, all right, we're doing this, we're doing that. When Eric Garner was killed and strangled, uh, and we saw that on video. On video, we saw that, and nothing happened. 
So body cameras, big deal. We, we saw mm -hmm. 25 years ago, we saw uh, King being beaten down in L.A. Nothing happened. We have a country that is in disrepair, morally and ethically, all right? And until we get back to some point of sanity, because police officers come from the society, you cannot expect to find some miraculous uh, change in policing when the, when the overall population of the country is going in a different is that what we're, direction. Is that what the United States, the communities, the Black Lives Matter movement, is that what they're asking? They're, are, are they asking for miraculous change? Or are they just asking for people to be reasonable towards other citizens? Reasonable is believable. Reasonable, Black Lives Matter are not the problem. They are, a, they are crying out and saying this is wrong. And uh, truthfully, we don't need more black cops in the, in the black neighborhood, more Latino cops in the Latino. We need good police officers to do the job. There are white cops that I worked with years ago. I would back them up to the hilt in any given situation because of their integrity. If your character is not where it should be, you cannot sustain yourself in law enforcement. No matter how good you might mm -hmm. be in, in giving out, making arrests, using a gun, a baton, if your character is flawed, it's going to come out in your performance. And we have people who are taking this job that do not have the character or the moral fiber to put on that uniform to serve the public. This is not the it's average true. everyday job. This is a calling yeah. that you fulfill. And if you were not called to do this, it's going to create problems. Taking yeah. a scared cop with a gun is like putting a drunk behind the wheel of a car. And in New York, a lot yeah. of these cops are scared. So let me, let me say something right quick. I, uh, okay, so years ago, when I came out the police academy, you would have the junior police officers like paired up with senior officers with time on to teach them the ropes. So now what you have in, 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 in the police department, you have like literally uh, officers like one year out the academy that call FTO, field training officers, teaching the new officers. I mean, with one year on the job, what can you teach a new officer who's only a few months out the police academy? You know, so that's basically what we have. And what they do now is they put these, these new officers in what's called the impact zone, where there's like high crime impact zones. So basically, all they get to see is the bad stuff, the robberies, the rapes, the murders, the stabbings, the shootings. They never get to see the good part. We have something that's called the uh, uh, NCO program, where basically they, they train two officers to be community officers. All officers need to be trained to be better community officers, not just two. Two. Like two out of out of, <laughs> out of two out of two out of out of out of out of the four to twelve, which is about yes. thirty five people. You have two officers, wow. so everybody needs that training, you know. So I'm I'm glad you you raised that. We just got a, a tweet just a couple minutes ago. Austin watching this live says, "I have to spend four plus years learning how to teach a subject I already know." Why do officers then spend only 19 weeks in training? And of course, I'm sure that number varies a little bit. Um, so mm -hmm. that picks up on what you were, you were saying. But Betty, I want to bring you in on this conversation with this next tweet. This is from Gopi, who says, we need to stop militarizing and equipping uh, the force with lethal weapons and showcasing a display of arms as if police are at war with people. Do you think part of the problem is, is what he calls a militarization? Uh, 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 reluctance to uh, deactivate a, a situation by talking and instead resorting to the gun? Right. And you're, you go right up the force continuum, which is what police officers learn. You learn uh, how officer presence is your first line of defense. So if you've got someone who's scared and uh, doesn't know how to talk to the community he's serving, then, you, then that's when you have problems. A uh, perfect example of that would my husband and I were the only two Caucasians on a Metrolink train out of St. Louis going to um, out in the county. And the Metro officer came in there. He didn't know I was a chief of police. He didn't know anything about me. Uh, and just asked me and my husband for our tickets. I stood up and said, why are you asking only us because we're Caucasian? If you're that scared, you don't need to be wearing a badge. Huh. So that that's where a lot of the, the fears come from is that uh, and fear perpetrates, uh, if someone's scared, they're in fear for their life. I am so sick of hearing that as an excuse for killing people is, uh, I'm in fear for my life. You, you know, but, years, ago, uh, um, years ago, years ago in the academy, I don't even know if they still teach it, we was called something called uh, verbal judo. Verbal you remember? Judo. You, you yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, basically how to de-elevate situations. De-escalate. And, 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 you know, I mean, somebody, somebody, 
verbally uh, aggressive towards you, you can't, you can't beat them up with a stick. I mean, a lot of these officers, they take this job so personal. They take it very personal. You know, you signed on the dotted line. You got to chase somebody three blocks, that's part of your job. Once you cuff them, it's over. It's over. You know, you don't owe them nothing. You do the paperwork and you send them to the judge. You let the judge do whatever he got to do. The lawyers do whatever they got to do. You can't take it personal being a police officer. And a lot of these new officers, that's what they do. You have officers, that's all they do. Every arrest, they bring somebody in the precinct fighting, arguing, bloody. Some officers are known. That's, that's just how they bring guys in. I have never, ever brought somebody in fighting, screaming. I've had guys thank me. Thank me, <laughs> officer. Yeah. I'm so serious. Why would they be? Thank, thank you. Thank you for not beating because to I showed a, them because they did pulp? because I didn't get them locked up. Yeah. They got them locked up. Right. I showed them. I treated them respect. There's right. no reason for me to disrespect them when I locked them up. And I've seen officers on my days off. I'm eating in the local precincts. I don't have to watch my back being a police officer. I feel most comfortable walking, eating, supporting those those um those businesses in the community where I work. I don't have to watch because I've never disrespected nobody. Right. I've never violated anybody by going in their pockets and, and anything unlawfully like that. Right. It, it's very Dignity true. Dignity and respect. Yes, I, I did. A, I worked on a case. I sent two police officers to prison, one for brutality. He maimed the guy. The guy could not open his arm fully. Yeah. And, a, and a desk officer was trying to protect the cop that, that had assaulted him. But I, I got a hold of that case, and that co police officer went to prison. Let me just remind our audience who are watching about a story that happened um, a few weeks back with... A, killing of Dallas police officers. So mm. let me just remind you here, this is a New York Times headline. Five Dallas officers were killed wow. as payback, police chief says. You can see the officers here literally in the line of fire. Mm -hmm. The police, you, you want to go first? I know where this is going. You don't know where it's going, <laughs> but you, you, you <laughs> take it where you want it to go and then I'll bring it back. Go ahead. Derek. Okay, so I don't, I don't condone killing in any shape, form or fashion. Right. But you know, since I was a kid, I've heard about these, these cops shooting people and you know, people are angry. Because mm -hmm. this is an all-time high for me, seeing these, these, these people shot by police officers. And I'm a police officer, and I'm, I'm, I'm terrified sometimes just driving home. Because I know if I get stopped, I shouldn't have to pull out my ID to say I'm a police officer. I mean, I'm in fear, too, being a black man just driving home in the city I work in. And that shouldn't be. So I, I don't condone any type of shooting. But people are upset, and they're tired. And they, 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 they want to be heard. They want to be heard. So this is, and, and that's a really great point, very valuable point. The police chief for Dallas, yeah, it was wow. really impressive. He was out there, he was talking, he was smoothing the way, he was talking about Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and then he said this to people who were really, really upset with the police. Have a listen. Don't be a part of the problem. We're hiring. <laughs> We're hiring. Uh, get off that protest line and, and, and put an application in. And we'll put you in your neighborhood and help we will help you resolve some of the problems you're protesting about. You know, I've, I've, I've talked to some of the kids in the neighborhood and they, they have so much respect for me. And I've, 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 I tell them sometimes, you, you, you gotta get this job. This, this is an amazing job. You're 21, you're 23 years old. You need to get that job because I know other officers, young like you, in four or five years, they're going to have their own house. They're going to be inviting their family to their own house. But a lot of the guys in the neighborhood, they don't have anybody to tell them this. They have no idea. You know, they have no idea what the police, it is the, the police, being a police officer is the most amazing job. It is the, you get to see everything firsthand. You get to see everything firsthand. Mm -hmm. And I've been in people's houses. I've talked to people. I've totally changed thousands and thousands of people's life. I've, I've, not, I've not made a lot of arrests. I've made 72 arrests, 78 arrests in 21 years. But I have touched thousands and thousands of people's lives, mm -hmm. being, the, being the officer I am. And, yeah. But you know, it seems like they don't want that type of officer anymore because if you're not bringing in those numbers, they try and get rid of you, they try and fire you, all that kind of stuff. So th this type of officer that he and I, uh, that he was and that I am, th those days are gone. We're, we're, we're like, we're like done. What, Chief, what and, Chief Brown said is very true. No, go ahead, Betty, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, and I, I agree, you know, I've taught in the inner city, uh, teaching policing, and I'd have, uh, I taught in 100% African-American school right after the Mike Brown shooting. And I have you know, students say, listen, I never thought about policing until you, you explained it to me how it is and the ethical policing. The six building blocks of ethical policing was one thing I hit really hard my last year there. However, the, you have um, 
certain standards that the bigger police departments are looking for, such as a credit rating, or um, they want to know about your relatives, they want to know about, and then all of that stuff, that play comes to play, and that, and that helps to discriminate not having those good officers that, hey, I want to go and serve my community, but my community is putting these restrictions on this hiring, um, because think about it, if someone lives in a high crime, high poverty area, they have a higher uh, uh, rate of buying things, so their credit scores are sometimes lower. So that affects you a hiring procedure because a lot of departments ask for hiring. A lot of departments now want you to have 60 hours of college credit. So, and some person that says, well, I don't really want to go to college, I want to be a police officer, those days are, are limited now in some departments. Right, when so, I was, I'm sorry, when I was coming into ahead. the department, the doctor was palpating me. Hmm, 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 hmm. Oh, I think, Mr. Budskin, I think you have a heart murmur. I'm going to have to reject you. Really? A heart murmur? Yes. Yeah. So I started talking medical terminology to him. And he's looking at me. I said, you're, you're board certified? He says, yes. He said, how, how do you know all that stuff? I went to school like you went to school. All of a sudden, I didn't have a heart murmur anymore. Huh. See, I was a competitive runner. So if I had had a heart murmur, I'd have been dead long before I could have mm. seen him. Or you're female black, you have scoliosis of the spine because of the curve in your spine. That's like telling an Asian man there's something wrong with his eyes, all right? There are a so multiplicity... they trying to get certain people not to actually... To precisely. Wow. And then right. outside of the people who are qualified, then you have the people who have been castigated and nullified because of corrupt policing where they've been fraudulently or illegally searched stopped, frisked, and what was in their pocket that never should have been retrieved from the pocket is now used to arrest them, a joint or something like that. So they can't go to college and get financial aid because if you have a drug arrest, you can't mm -hmm. get financial aid. So we have to understand how racism works. It's not about going into the restaurant to have a cup of coffee. All of this is part of the pattern of racism, and they use policing to keep young black men out of the departments. They don't want black men in policing. So it's, it's stories like that and reasons like that that we see this tweet from Amina. She says, well, if there is no way to fix it, shouldn't we now level the floor, start from zero, input citizen agency, and find a better quote-unquote system? So that's kind of an anarchist view of it, uh, but there is another suggestion. This is a video comment we got from someone named Imani Jaffer, and this is what she's doing to change things. My name is Imani Jafar, and I'm the director of the Office of Police Conduct Review for Minneapolis, which is a civilian office that is housed in the Civil Rights Department. We work alongside the Minneapolis Police Department to monitor police misconduct cases. I make joint decisions with the Commander of Internal Affairs about the route of a case. As a case progresses through our process, a review panel with public members and lieutenants make a decision about whether a case has merit. This is a system that gives the public a meaningful opportunity to have a voice in the police misconduct discipline system and helps build community trust. So Betty, do you think that's a system uh, that could be replicated other places? I'm sure it would be if they wanted the change. You see, uh, we've known what's been going on in St. Louis for years. I could have told you that when I was a teenager, what was going on before I even put a badge on. However, it took the Department of Justice to come in and say, listen, you're writing all these tickets to these poverty, uh, in, in po poverty stricken areas. And you're going to have to want that change. You're going to have to want to implement that. So it sounds like a great idea, but the change has got to be there for the for everyone to want to change. That's what I'm saying. So I, I ask myself sometimes, I'm saying the police department says we want this community better relation with police, but but do they do they really want that? Because if they wanted that, it's it's to me it's so easy to do. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is tell the police officers to stop harassing people. It's it's so simple. And that, wow. that comes with okay, wow, this so guy's simple. this 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 gentleman's double parked. So instead of writing him a summons, let's just ask him to move his car. See Derek and Graham and Betty so logical what you've all been saying so incredibly revealing about how police think what's happening inside the u.s police forces around the country i i think i have the answer i just clone all of you and send you around the united states and we're you know done what? We, we You're welcome. We, we, we'd all be dead <laughs> you'd have a bunch of dead cops because they don't want it solved that quick because right, there's no, no money there'll be no money here so it's Graham, all about the money derek betty thank you so much for your insight malika valau Thanks, Femi. It was a good conversation. All right. <laughs> it has been interesting. Um, Derek said we need part eight. We're going to end up part two, but to be continued. Hashtag A Day Stream. We're taking the conversation online. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care.